Good day students, so this is the continuation of our discussion on enzymes. Enzymes can be classified as intracellular or extracellular. An enzyme is intracellular if it is produced inside the cell and it is retained inside the cell because its function is related to one of the processes happening in the cytoplasm or organelles of the cell. An enzyme is extracellular if it is synthesized by the cell and is secreted outside the cell because its function is important in the extracellular compartment or environment. A good example of extracellular enzyme is pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is produced by the chief cells of the stomach and the chief cells will secrete the pepsinogen into the lumen of the stomach. So that makes the pepsinogen as an extracellular enzyme. In the lumen of the stomach, the pepsinogen will be acted upon by hydrochloric acid, converting it into the active pepsin. And the pepsin can initiate protein digestion. Creatine kinase is an intracellular enzyme and it is found in high amounts in cardiac muscles. This is the cell membrane of the cardiac muscle. And then take a look at the mitochondrion inside the cytoplasm of that cardiac muscle. And then this is the creatine kinase. So based on the location, you can really say that the creatine kinase is an intracellular enzyme. Now, please take note that this CK should be found within the cardiac muscles. In cases wherein the cardiac muscles will die, let's say the, the patient has acute myocardial infarction, then these cells will undergo lysis and what will happen is creatine kinase now is released in the blood. And the presence of high creatine kinase in the blood would suggest that there is an under, undergoing lysis of cardiac muscles and the patient could be probably having acute myocardial infarction or heart attack. Majority of the enzymes in the body are intracellular, so meaning you're supposed to find them inside the cells and not in the blood. Should the cells in the body be subjected to trauma or injury, the cells would undergo lysis and there would be leakage of these enzymes in the blood, signifying now cellular damage. Take a look at this picture. You have here the three liver enzymes. You have ALT, AST, and ALP. These are intracellular enzymes, so meaning you're supposed to find them only in the cytoplasm or organelles of the hepatocytes. But take a look at the normal ranges of these enzymes. So I will use ALT as an example. A value of less than 50 units per liter in the serum is considered normal for ALT. Going back, these enzymes are intracellular, so meaning you're not supposed to find them in the blood. But how come a value of less than 50 units per liter is still considered as normal? Remember, cells in the body get old. Old cells die. With their death, some of the enzymes will leak out from their cytoplasm into the blood. So the value of less than 50 units per liter for ALT would only reflect the enzymes that leaked out from the dying old cells. But if you go beyond that, that will now suggest cellular damage brought about by the factors that can cause disease in the liver or hepatocytes. Take a look at this chemical reaction catalyzed by creatine kinase. You have here the substrates creatine and ATP. Creatine kinase is a transferase enzyme. It will particularly transfer a phosphate group. So what will happen is one of the phosphate group in ATP will be transferred to creatine. Converting creatine now into phosphocreatine and ATP will become ADP. The purpose of the creatine kinase is to store energy. How do you think it will store energy? ATP can be used by the cells in the body as energy. So to conserve that, to save that, one of the phosphate will be temporarily removed from ATP and that phosphate will be transferred to phosphocreatine. Should the cells in the body will run out of energy, the creatine kinase will do the reverse reaction. The phosphocreatine now will be reconverted to creatine and the phosphate that was removed from phosphocreatine will now be loaded again into the ADP to form ATP. And the cells in the body will now have ATP as source of energy. 
Now, what's the importance of me discussing this chemical reaction? I have to discuss that particular chemical reaction to introduce to you the term isoenzyme. Isoenzyme is a group of enzymes that are chemically different from each other. They have different properties from each other, but they can catalyze the same chemical reaction. So I want you to take a look at the table. You have here creatine kinase isoenzymes. You have creatine kinase isoenzyme 1, 2, and 3. These are totally different enzymes. They have different compositions. They have different properties. But they convert creatine to phosphocreatine with a conversion of ATP to ADP. So meaning, ha, isoenzymes are totally different from each other, but they catalyze the same chemical reaction. CK1 isoenzyme is found in the brain. CK2 is found in the heart. CK3 is found in the skeletal muscle. These are totally different enzymes. But in the organs where they can be found, they catalyze the same reaction. The conversion of creatine to creatine phosphate with subsequent conversion of ATP to ADP. The first enzyme that we will discuss is gamma glutamyl transferase. From the name of the enzyme, you can already predict that it is a transferase enzyme. And it particularly transfers glutamyl group. So I want you to take a look at the sample chemical reaction that this enzyme can catalyze. You have here the substrate gamma glutamyl para nitroanilide and it is made to react with glycyl glycine. What do you notice? At the end of the reaction, the gamma glutamyl from para nitroanilide is now transferred to glycyl glycine. So that's why the enzyme is named gamma glutamyl transferase. So if you will be asked, What's the first digit in the enzyme nomenclature of this enzyme? The answer should be number 2. Take note that gamma glutamyl transferase can be found in a lot of organs in the body, but the highest concentration is found in the bile duct. So, if there is an increase in the level of gamma glutamyl transferase enzyme in the blood, that will now indicate bile duct obstruction, and problems with the other organs listed in the picture. But for now, it's enough that you know that gamma glutamyl transferase is found in highest concentration in the bile duct. One of the diseases associated with high serum gamma glutamyl transferase is bile duct obstruction. Bile duct obstruction can be caused by gallstones. It can also be caused by parasites. The mechanism behind this one is that the gallstone or the parasite is inducing the epithelial cells of the bile duct to increase the production of gamma glutamyl transferase. What's the reason with increasing the levels of gamma glutamyl transferase? It's still unknown until today. But the thing is, if there is increased production of gamma glutamyl transferase enzyme, some of these enzymes will now gain entrance into the blood. So what will happen is in patients with bile duct obstruction, their serum gamma glutamyl transferase will become elevated. Chemicals can also induce the epithelial cells of the bile duct to increase the production of gamma glutamyl transferase. And one of the important chemicals that I want you to take note is alcohol. So you don't need to memorize the other drugs I mentioned in the PPT because if they can induce GGT, the induction is not as much as alcohol. So, people who are chronic alcoholic drinkers would also have high gamma glutamyl transferases in their blood. Take a look at these pictures. This is the alcohol. Once the alcohol will come in contact with the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of the epithelial cells of the bile duct, those cells are induced to produce high levels of gamma glutamyl transferase. High serum GGT can be found in bile duct obstruction. It's very important to educate the people you know who are having gallstones to have them removed as soon as possible. So take a look at the gallbladder in the picture. You have here multiple gallstones. Do you know that some of these gallstones might lodge in the bile duct, causing now obstruction? Worst thing is, 
if the gallstones will also block the pancreatic duct because as you can see in the picture the bile ducts and the pancreatic ducts will all drain towards the duodenum so if the gallstone will block the pancreatic duct the enzymes in the pancreatic duct will no longer reach the duodenum i'm talking about amylase and lipase these enzymes are initially secreted as inactive and they only become active once they reach the duodenum but the thing is if the pancreatic duct is blocked these enzymes will not be able to reach the duodenum they will be activated while they are in the pancreas and since they are digestive enzymes they will now start digesting the pancreas and that is life threatening chronic alcoholism is also characterized with high serum gamma glutamyl transferase serum gamma glutamyl transferase can be two to three times higher than the normal range in people who are chronic alcoholic drinker but take note if the patient will stop drinking alcohol the ggt level in the blood will return back to normal two to three weeks after so if you are a doctor and you are managing a patient who is a chronic alcoholic drinker and the patient promised that he will stop drinking alcohol during the second time that the patient will visit you and the patient will claim that he already followed your advice not to stop drinking alcohol so for you to be sure that he really did that you can have his ggt tested if the ggt is still elevated then you will have a clue that the patient is lying there's also one enzyme that we can use to diagnose bile duct obstruction and that is alp the problem with alp is that it has a lot of tissue sources alp can be found in the liver particularly in the bile duct it can be found in the bone it can be found in the placenta so a high alp would not only mean bile duct obstruction it can only mean bone diseases so for you to confirm whether the high ALP is because of bile duct obstruction, you also need to request gamma glutamyl transferase. If both of them are elevated, then that is, a, uh, that is suggesting the probability of bile duct obstruction. If ALP is elevated and gamma glutamyl transferase is normal, you should look for another reason why the ALP is elevated. The next enzyme that we will discuss is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. From the name of the enzyme, expect that it will remove hydrogen atom from glucose 6-phosphate. And since hydrogen will be removed and transferred to another substrate, then this is an example of oxidoreductase reaction. Because gaining hydrogen would mean that the substrate will become reduced. Losing hydrogen would mean that the substrate will become oxidized. Now, take a look at the chemical reaction catalyzed by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So I will put a red arrow for you to immediately see the chemical reaction. You have here the glucose 6-phosphate and it is made to react with NADP. And with the help of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, one of the hydrogen atoms from glucose 6-phosphate will be transferred to NADP. NADP will become NADPH, so meaning it became reduced. Why? Because gaining hydrogen would mean that you gain the electron of hydrogen, you will become reduced. And the glucose 6-phosphate will be converted to phosphogluconate. In the process of glycolysis, glucose is converted to pyruvate. The first step in glycolysis is the action of hexokinase to glucose. Glucose plus ATP with the action of hexokinase, one of the phosphate from ATP will be transferred to glucose, converting the glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. This glucose 6-phosphate will undergo several chemical reactions until such time that it will be converted to pyruvate. But the thing is, some of the glucose 6-phosphate will be acted upon by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Let's take a closer look at the chemical reaction catalyzed by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So as you can see in the picture, glucose 6-phosphate is made to react with NADP. Hydrogen will be removed from glucose 6-phosphate and transferred to NADP, converting it into NADPH. 
and the glucose 6-phosphate will be oxidized to form the 6-phosphogluconate. So, the chemical reaction is important in the production or generation of the NADPH enzyme. So, what do you think is the importance of generating this NADPH enzyme? We will now discuss the importance of generating NADPH from the chemical reaction catalyzed by glucose 6-phosphate. This is an oxidizing agent. Oxidizing agents are destructive to our tissues. And what protects our tissues from the effects of oxidizing agents is glutathione. In the process, glutathione will be oxidized by the oxidizing agent. But the thing is, we will always be exposed to oxidizing agents. That's why we need to reconvert back the oxidized glutathione to its reduced form. And what will reduce glutathione is the NADPH that we generated from the chemical reaction catalyzed by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So what will the NADPH do? It will transfer the hydrogen to the oxidized glutathione. If the oxidized glutathione will gain hydrogen, it would only mean that it has gained an electron, therefore it will be reduced. So just try to imagine, there are people who are born with no glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme. So therefore, they cannot reconvert or recycle their oxidized glutathione back to reduced glutathione. And that will now put them at risk to the effects of the oxidizing agents. Glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is important in producing NADPH to maintain the reduced form of glutathione. Reduced glutathione protects the red blood cells from the effects of the oxidizing agents. If the person does not have glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, then their red cells are not protected from these oxidizing agents. So what will happen? There would be damage in the cell membrane of the red cells causing them to lyse, resulting to anemia. Number two, the oxidizing agents can also cause the hemoglobin in the red blood cells to precipitate. This is a normal red blood cell with hemoglobin. If the person is born with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, the hemoglobin will be oxidized by the oxidizing agents, causing now the hemoglobin to precipitate as Heinz bodies. You don't have to mind that one. As long as you know that the hemoglobin will be precipitated and they will now be present as Heinz bodies in the cytoplasm of the red cells. These are red blood cells with a precipitated hemoglobin in the form of Heinz bodies. Red blood cells can squeeze through small sinuses because they have this property we refer to as deformability. The problem with red blood cells with precipitated hemoglobin, they will now lose their ability to deform every time that they will squeeze through small sinuses. And what will happen is, as they pass through the sinusoids of the spleen, there's a chance that they will be trapped in there and they will be destroyed by the macrophages in the spleen. So what will happen to a person with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency? Their red blood cells are prematurely destroyed in the spleen, resulting to anemia. The third enzyme that we will talk about is aspartate aminotransferase. So let's try to take a look at the name of the enzyme. Aspartate is the substrate and the enzyme is supposed to transfer an amino group from aspartate to another substrate. So take a look at the picture of the chemical reaction catalyzed by AST. Aspartate is made to react with alpha-ketoglutarate. And the amino group of aspartate will be transferred to alpha-ketoglutarate, converting alpha-ketoglutarate to glutamate. And since there's a transfer of a functional group, this enzyme is considered as a transferase enzyme. And the first digit in its enzyme nomenclature should be number 2. And after the aspartate has lost the amino group, it will now be converted to oxaloacetate. So since there is a transfer of amino group from aspartate to alpha-ketoglutarate, we will name this enzyme as aspartate aminotransferase. AST 
is also known as SGOT. So what do you mean by SGOT? Serum Glutamic Oxaloacetic Transaminase. But don't worry about this other name of AST. You just simply have to look at the names of the products. You have the glutamate and oxaloacetate. So might as well just write down serum glutamic oxaloacetic. And then you have to write down transaminase because there is a transfer of amino group. So for you to remember that AST is also known as SGOT, you have to simply remember pag may nag ask may sagot. And I intentionally put there the heart shape instead of letter O because this enzyme is found in high amounts in the cardiac muscles. So expect that one of the clinical significance of having high levels of AST in the blood is acute myocardial infarction. Let us now discuss the importance of aspartate aminotransferase. Please recall that in the chemical reaction, aspartate was converted to oxaloacetate after it has donated its amino group to alpha-ketoglutarate. Oxaloacetate is an important compound involved in the Krebs cycle. And you know very well that Krebs cycle is involved in the ATP production or energy production. Let's discuss this picture. You have here glucose being converted to pyruvate in the process called glycolysis. And glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. As soon as pyruvate is already available, it will enter the mitochondrion and is converted to acetyl coenzyme A. This acetyl coenzyme A will now become part of the Krebs cycle. This is the pyruvate generated from glucose in the process called glycolysis in the cytoplasm. Pyruvate will enter the mitochondrion and is converted to acetyl coenzyme A. Now, to start the Krebs cycle, this acetyl coenzyme A is made to react with oxaloacetate. And from what we can remember from the chemical reaction catalyzed by AST, the aspartate will donate its amino group to alpha-ketoglutarate and aspartate will become oxaloacetate. And the oxaloacetate now will participate in the Krebs cycle. So AST allows us to use the aspartate amino acid as source of energy by converting it into oxaloacetate so that it can contribute to the continuation of the Krebs cycle. Aspartate aminotransferase or serum glutamic oxaloacetic transaminase is widely found in tissues. But the three Organs or tissues that I want you to remember are the heart, liver, and skeletal muscles. So people with high serum AST or high serum SGOT could be having problems with liver, hepatitis, heart, acute myocardial infarction, muscle, maybe probably to trauma or injury or other diseases affecting the muscles. In terms of acute myocardial infarction, it's important to take note that the serum AST level will start to become elevated 4 to 6 hours after the onset of pain. As future med techs and future doctors, it's very important for you to remember this. So if there's a patient who would go to the ER because of chest pain, you need to ask when did the pain start to occur. Because if the patient started to feel the pain one hour ago, it's useless to request for serum AST or serum SGOT. Another problem with AST is that it is also found in other tissues such as the liver and skeletal muscle. So let's say for example, you have a patient who has hepatitis and the patient is experiencing chest pain and chest pain can be caused by acute myocardial infarction or maybe muscle spasm. So how will you now know if the high AST level is because of the acute myocardial infarction or it's just because the patient has hepatitis. So that's the problem with relying solely on AST as a marker for acute myocardial infarction because again, it is found in other tissues. The next enzyme we will discuss is alanine aminotransferase or ALT. I intentionally typed the letter L in a bigger font 
because ALT is primarily used to assess hepatic disorders or liver disorders. Now, take a look at the chemical reaction catalyzed by this enzyme. You have the substrates alanine and oxoglutarate, and the amino group of alanine is transferred to oxoglutarate, converting it into glutamate, while alanine is converted to pyruvate. ALT is also known as SGPT, and just like in the case of AST, just look at the names of the products of the reaction. So you can already predict that SGPT stands for serum glutamic pyruvic transaminase. ALT is distributed in some tissues but the highest concentration is found in the liver. Both AST and ALT are found in the liver. So expect that the two will become elevated in liver disorders. But the thing is, ALT is more specific to the liver than AST. Remember, AST can be found in the heart, in the liver, in skeletal muscles, and other tissues. So therefore, a high level of AST does not always mean that there is liver disorder. It could also mean that there is what? Skeletal muscle disorder or acute myocardial infarction. Another thing that I want you all to take note is that in terms of biliary obstruction, yes, ALT could be elevated, but ALT is more elevated in liver disorder rather than the baldac obstruction. Take note, in baldac obstruction, it's still better to request for GGT than ALT. Next is creatine kinase. This enzyme is very important in the storage of energy and regeneration of ATP in organs where we can find this creatine kinase. Now, the chemical reaction catalyzed by creatine kinase would involve the substrates creatine and ATP. Creatine kinase will transfer the phosphate group from ATP to creatine, converting it into phosphocreatine, with subsequent conversion of ATP to ADP. Phosphocreatine now will store the phosphate group of ATP so that the ATP will not be utilized immediately by the cells in the body. But should there be starvation and fasting, the phosphocreatine will be recon reconverted back by creatine kinase to creatine. If that's the case, the phosphate group will be removed from phosphocreatine and returned back to ADP to form ATP because the body is under starvation and fasting state. So the body would need alternative sources of energy. And that is to break down phosphocreatine to release the phosphate so that you can regenerate the ATP. As future medical technologies and future doctors, it's very important to take note that creatine kinase is composed of subunits. We have subunits B and M. There are three isoenzymes of CK. Remember, isoenzymes are totally different enzymes, but they catalyze the same chemical reaction. There is that isoenzyme that we can find in the brain. There is that isoenzyme that we can find in the heart. And there is that isoenzyme that we can find in skeletal muscles. In the brain, we call it a CK1. And this CK1, or creatine kinase isoenzyme 1, has only the B subunits. That's why it's also referred to as CKBB. While the CK2, which is found predominantly in cardiac muscles, is composed of both M and B subunits. That's why it's named CKMB. While the muscle form or isoenzyme of CK has only M subunits. That's why it's called CKMM. If the patient will have stroke, expect that the cells will release CK1. If the patient will have acute myocardial infarction, expect that among the three isoenzymes of CK, it's the CKMB that will now contribute to the high levels of CK in the blood. Should there be muscle injury or trauma, expect that the CK elevation would be most likely because of the isoenzyme CK3. For you to remember that CK1 is in the brain, CK2 is in the heart, CK3 is in the muscles, you remember that gamitin mo na ang utak bago ang puso, bago mag-effort. The creatine kinase levels of men are higher than that of women because of the 
bulkier muscle mass of men. And expect that this enzyme will also elevate after strenuous activities or exercise. In terms of clinical significance, CKMB would indicate possibility of acute myocardial infarction. But if we're going to measure CK in the laboratory, we're going to measure all the three CK in the clinical sample. There are methods that will only particularly measure a certain isoenzyme. But in the method available in the laboratory, it will measure all the isoenzymes of CK. So it's very important for the med tech and the doctor to get the complete medical history and physical examination of the patient so that somehow the medical history and the physical examination will help in identifying whether the CK elevation is because of CK1, CK2, or CK3. In terms of acute myocardial infarction, the CK level will start to increase 4 to 6 hours after the onset of pain. And that's similar with AST. And since CK is also present in the muscle, remember the CK3 isoenzyme, expect that CK level will also elevate in skeletal muscle disorders. CK1 will become elevated in cases of stroke and other CNS disorders. But don't be surprised if the serum CK level of the patient is still normal even if the patient is obviously having a stroke. Why? Because once there is stroke, the CK will not leak into the blood. It will leak into the cerebrospinal fluid. But there are cases of patients who have stroke and still also have high levels of serum CK. And when the CK was tested, it was found out that majority of the CK there are CK1 or CKBB. So what do you think is the reason why the serum CK will elevate because of CK1? Probably there is trauma and the trauma caused the loss of the blood-brain barrier, allowing now the CK1 to leak from the CSF into the blood. Amylase belongs to the group of hydrolase enzymes. So expect that this enzyme will break the bonds in large molecules producing smaller ones or smaller units. And the breakage of the bonds would involve the addition of water. In the case of amylase, it will break down starch and glycogen into simple sugars. Amylase is found in both salivary glands and pancreas. So there are two forms of amylase. We have the pancreatic amylase and we have the salivary amylase. Take note, the salivary amylase is also known as thialin. Some amylase enzymes can also be found in the fallopian tube, intestine, and stomach. So expect that if the patient has acute pancreatitis, one of the enzymes that will elevate in the blood is amylase. If the person has infection of the salivary glands, expect that the amylase level will also become elevated. The same is true with the disorders affecting the fallopian tube, intestine, and the stomach. But take note, the major sources of amylase are the pancreas and the salivary glands. Amylase functions to digest starch in the food that we are eating. Starch digestion starts in the mouth because of the salivary amylase. As soon as the food is swallowed and the food will latch in the stomach, the salivary amylase is inactivated by the hydrochloric acid. But don't worry, the digestion of the starch will resume once the food will reach the small intestine, particularly the duodenum, because that is where the pancreas would drain the pancreatic amylase. As mentioned, starch digestion starts in the mouth because of the thialin or salivary amylase. But as soon as the food will reach the stomach, the amylase, salivary amylase or thialate, will be inactivated by the hydrochloric acid. Now, the starch digestion will just resume once the food will reach the duodenum where the pancreas will drain the pancreatic amylase. This is just to show you guys that the amylase is produced in the pancreas and it is drained through the pancreatic duct into the duodenum to resume the digestion of starch in the food. 
In case of acute pancreatitis, serum amylase is expected to be elevated because one of the tissue sources is pancreas. The elevation in the serum amylase level would start 2 to 12 hours after the onset of effect. Acute pancreatitis would usually present with upper epigastric pain or upper abdominal pain. And some patients would claim that the pain is so severe that they cannot anymore stand up. And sometimes the pain would also radiate to the back. But the problem with this kind of clinical manifestation, you might also mistake this one as gastric ulcer or bile duct obstruction. That's why we need to run amylase and GGT in a case of a patient who is complaining of upper epigastric pain to rule out what? Bile duct obstruction and acute pancreatitis. The problem with amylase is that it has a lot of tissue sources. That's why it is expected to be elevated also in people with mumps. Mumps is the viral infection of the parotid gland, which is one of our salivary glands. Remember, we have thialin, our salivary amylase. Amylase can also be elevated in intra-abdominal diseases, perforated peptic ulcer. We have acute appendicitis, remember. This enzyme can be found in the intestine and in the stomach. So any problems related to these organs will also result to high serum amylase level. And amylase can also be elevated in cases of ectopic pregnancy. Remember, one of the sources, tissue sources of amylase is the fallopian tube. The most commonly involved site for ectopic pregnancy is the fallopian tube. So if there is that implanted embryo in the fallopian tube, cells will die there and they will release amylase into the blood. Take note, amylase, it's not specific to the pancreas because it can be elevated in diseases affecting other organs. So let's say, for example, if you have a patient with presenting with upper abdominal pain and then at the same time the patient is also having mumps, the high serum amylase cannot give you an idea whether the patient is having um, bile duct obstruction or acute pancreatitis. That's why we need an enzyme that is more specific to pancreas than amylase. And what enzyme is that? That is the enzyme that is also drained into the pancreatic duct, into the duodenum, to help in the digestion. But this time, it will help digest triglycerides. And the enzyme I'm talking about is lipase. Lipase acts on triglyceride, breaking it down into the glycerol backbone and three fatty acids. So I want you to take a look at the chemical structure of triglyceride. Please appreciate the glycerol backbone. And each of the carbons of the glycerol backbone, you have there attached fatty acids. So since there are three carbons in triglyceride, expect that there are three fatty acids. In the action of lipase, the lipase will break down the bonds that connect the fatty acids to the glycerol and then the fatty acids will be liberated. But take a look at the chemical reaction. The breaking of the bonds was made possible by the addition of water. So therefore, lipase is an example of a hydrolase similar to amylase. Lipase is produced by the cells of the exocrine glands of the pancreas and it is drained towards the duodenum via the pancreatic duct and it aids in the digestion of triglycerides. The main reason why triglycerides have to be broken down into its components which are the fatty acids and the glycerol backbone but take note that sometimes only one fatty acid will be removed converting triglyceride to diglyceride Sometimes two fatty acids can be removed, converting the triglyceride to monoglyceride. But the point is, lipase will break down triglycerides into smaller components. Triglyceride is a large lipid. Therefore, it is not easily absorbed in the small intestine. That's why for it to be absorbed and used as a source of energy, it must be broken down into smaller units. So take a look at the left side of the photo. You have the triglyceride molecule and it is broken down by lipase into monoglyceride by releasing two fatty acids with the addition of water and then this monoglyceride and fatty acids since they are small they can be easily absorbed by the 
simple columnar cells of the intestine. But as soon as they have reached the cytoplasm of the columnar cells of the intestine, the monoglyceride and the fatty acids are made to what undergo reassemble to form the triglyceride. So the main purpose of the lipase is to just simply make the triglyceride smaller so that it can be absorbed. Serum lipase level will only start to rise 3 to 6 hours after the onset of pain in acute pancreatitis, while amylase can rise as early as 2 hours. Yes, serum amylase level may rise more rapidly than lipase in the case of acute pancreatitis. But the thing is, lipase is more advantageous than amylase in terms of diagnosing acute pancreatitis. Number one, this serum lipase level will not be affected by disorders concerning or involving the salivary gland. That makes lipase more specific to pancreas than salivary gland. The highest concentration of lipase is found in the pancreatic cells, although there are, there are small amounts that we can find in the stomach and the intestine. But the thing is, if the lipase is elevated, it really suggests the, the, the possibility of acute pancreatitis if you're going to compare it with increased level of amylase. Expect that this uh, serum lipase will also be elevated in duodenal ulcers, perforated gastric or peptic ulcers because there are low levels of this enzyme in the stomach and intestine. The next enzyme is alkaline phosphatase. So let's try to take a look at the chemical reaction catalyzed by this particular enzyme. So I want you to take a look at the substrate. It's a phosphate monoester. So it's a chemical with a phosphate attached to it via an ester band. So the blue arrow is pointing to the ester band. You have their band O band. That's an ester band. So the phosphate is attached to that compound via the ester band. Now alkaline phosphatase will break that ester band with the addition of water. So therefore alkaline phosphatase is, is what? a hydrolase enzyme and what will happen is phosphate will be liberated from the compound that it was attached to via the ester band that's the reason why this enzyme is named as phosphatase because it will liberate phosphate from a compound the optimum temperature for this enzyme to work is 9 to 10 uh, optimum ph by the way is 9 to 10 that's the reason why this enzyme is named alkaline phosphatase. So the main purpose of this enzyme is to make phosphate ion available for it to be consumed in the different physiological processes in the body. For you to remember the tissue sources of alkaline phosphatase, just remember the mnemonics HOPI. H stands for hepatic or liver. But there's one thing I want to clarify Yes, there are ALP enzymes in the hepatocytes, but majority of these enzymes are found in the, in the epithelial cells of the bile duct. So expect that high ALP level would indicate more of bile duct obstruction rather than liver disorder. If you want to diagnose a case of liver disorder, you should request ALT instead of ALP. But if you want to know whether the patient is having bile duct obstruction brought about by parasites or gallstones, then you go for ALP. And there's one enzyme that is also used for diagnosing bile duct obstruction. What enzyme was that again? Gamma glutamyl transferase. Very good. ALP is also found in osteoblast of the bone. Take a look at the osteoblast on the right side of the screen. As you can see, one of their uh, products, secretory products, is alkaline phosphatase and they are secreting this enzyme on the bony matrix. The main purpose of that alkaline phosphatase is to liberate phosphate ions from different chemicals so that the phosphate ions are free to uh, form complex with calcium to form the calcium hydroxyapatite which is responsible for the hardness of the bone. This enzyme is also present in the placenta and it is also present in the intestines and in, according to the references I've read Alkaline phosphatase has something to do with protecting the integrity of the um, intestine so that there would be no invasion of microorganisms. So, I want you to memorize the tissue sources of ALP, 
because this will help you understand the clinical significance of high serum ALP. Hopi, hepatic but more of the bile duct, osteoblast, placental, and intestinal ALP. Expect that serum ALP levels are normally higher in children and pregnant women than in men. Why in pregnant women? Because they have the placenta and one of the tissue sources of ALP is the placenta. Why the children? Because the children are actively growing in size. And with growth in size, it would mean that their bones are lengthening. And bones can only lengthen if there is deposition of bony matrix by the osteoblast. So therefore, the osteoblast will be releasing alkaline phosphatase. And some of them will reach the bloodstream. Now, since uh, one of the tissue sources of ALP is the liver, particularly the epithelial cells of the bile duct, expect that this enzyme will be elevated in biliary tract obstructions. And what else? Uh, take note. Uh, between GGT and ALP, which do you think is more reliable in assessing a case of bile duct obstruction? So, to answer that, you should always ask yourself which among them has the least number of tissue sources. Since ALP can be found in the liver, no, no, in the osteoblast, in the placenta, in the intestine, so it, it is considered as what less specific to bile duct than GGT. So that's why according to the discussion in the GGT a while ago, GGT can be used to confirm bile duct obstruction characterized with high ALP because ALP alone cannot suggest it's really a case of bile duct obstruction because you have other possible sources of ALP. In terms of liver disorder, yes, ALP can be slightly elevated, but if you are the doctor, if you're the medtech, please process ALT rather than ALP, ALT, alanine, alanine aminotransferase, rather than alkaline phosphatase. I have to discuss this for you to understand the other clinical significances of ALP. So take a look at the parathyroid gland in there. It's responsible for the production of parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone functions to increase blood calcium level. So if we want to increase our blood calcium level, where do you think we will get the calcium? We can get it from the diet. We can reabsorb the calcium that was filtered in the urine so that they will not be lost. And we can also mobilize calcium from the storage sites in the body. And what are these storage sites? The bones. So if the parathyroid hormone is present, the osteoclast will break down the bone matrix to release the calcium. And since there is breakdown of bone matrix by osteoclast, the osteoblast will try to repair that area by depositing new bone matrix. So expect that the osteoblast will be releasing high amounts of ALP. So what do you expect from a patient who has hyperthyroidism? Hyperthyroidism, meaning they have high levels of parathyroid, parathyroid hormone in their blood. So expect that there is increased activity of bone resorption. So the osteoblast will also compensate by forming new bone matrix. So expect that the ALP will be elevated in hyperparathyroidism. Vitamin D functions to increase blood calcium level. So what do you think will happen if a person will become deficient in vitamin D? So expect that that will have an impact on the blood calcium level. Low by vitamin D, expect low calcium. So if there is low calcium, that will be detected by the parathyroid gland. Parathyroid gland will release parathyroid hormone and parathyroid hormone will initiate bone resorption to correct the hypocalcemia or low blood calcium level secondary to the deficiency of vitamin D. ALP is elevated in the following disorders. Number one, hyperparathyroidism. And I know I have already explained this a while ago. ALP can be elevated in bone disorders such as osteomalacia and rickets. Osteomalacia is defined as the deficiency of vitamin D among adults. Rickets is defined as the vitamin D deficiency among children. So both of these disorders are characterized by 
deficiency of vitamin D. And you know very well the consequence if we have low vitamin D in the blood. That will result to what? Low blood calcium level. So there would be what? Bone resorption. And later on, there would be what? Replacement of the bone matrix by the osteoblast resulting now to high ALP activity. Osteogenic sarcoma is a cancer involving the bone. So this cancer would grow in size. It will invade normal bone matrix or tissue causing the bone now to be destroyed so expect that the osteoblast will be later osteoblast i mean will be later activated to fix the uh, damaged bone matrix alp level is also observed to be elevated in healing bone repairs especially after fractures and bone growth especially in growing children the second to the last enzyme that we will discuss is acid phosphatase. This catalyzes the same chemical reaction as that of alkaline phosphatase. The only difference is this one has an optimum pH set at 5.0. That's why it's called acid phosphatase. Now, there are a lot of possible tissue sources for acid phosphatase, but the one that I want you to remember at this point is the prostate. Since the major tissue source of ACP or acid phosphatase is the prostate, conditions affecting this gland would result to increased serum acid phosphatase concentration. Take a look at the prostate. It's located below the urinary bladder of males. And in, in the middle of the prostate, you have there the prostatic urethra. This is where the urine is drained from the urinary bladder. Now, the first disease that we will discuss is benign prostatic hyperplasia. So that's the one shown in the picture. In benign prostatic hyperplasia, the cells of the glands of the prostate have increased sensitivity to testosterone. Testosterone causes these cells to replicate or increase in number. So with the increase in the number of the cells in the glands of the prostate, expect that the prostate will become enlarged. The problem is as the prostate enlarges, it will cause obstruction or impingement of the prostatic urethra. That's why patients who have benign prostatic hyperplasia would usually complain of difficulty in urination. Second is prostatic carcinoma. Prostatic carcinoma usually develops at the posterior wall of the prostate, just like what is shown in the picture. So, there's a less chance that this tumor will cause obstruction of the urethra. So, if the patient has enlargement of the prostate or a mass in the prostate and it's associated with difficulty in urination, it's more of benign prostatic hyperplasia. If the patient has a known prostatic mass and still the patient can urinate without pain or discomfort, then there's a higher chance, I'm not saying it, it, it happens to all cases, there's a higher chance that the patient is having the malignant prostatic carcinoma. Both of these conditions would result to high acid phosphatase level in the blood. Now, this Acid phosphatase is part of the secretions of the prostate. So therefore, it can be passed out along with the semen. So acid phosphatase can also be used to investigate possible cases of rape. Because if, let's say, semen is left inside the vaginal canal, the doctor can just do the swabbing on the vag vaginal canal and test for the presence of acid phosphatase in the secretions. The last but not the least, the lactate dehydrogenase. Let's take a look at the chemical reaction it can catalyze. We have here the substrates lactate and NAD. So since there is NAD here, expect that this one will accept hydrogen. If there is transfer of hydrogen, then expect that this reaction is an oxidation reduction process, right? So what do you notice? At the end of the chemical reaction, one hydrogen from lactate was transferred to NAD, con uh, converting it into NADH. So in the process, NAD is reduced to form NADH and lactate is oxidized to form pyruvate. Of all the enzymes I have mentioned, 
the the one that is the least specific to a particular organ is lactate dehydrogenase. So meaning this enzyme has a lot of tissue sources. This is the list of the tissue sources of LDH. So with the list, you can already conclude that the enzyme that is the least tissue specific is LDH. By the way, LDH has five isoenzymes. Again, isoenzymes are completely different enzymes, but they catalyze the same chemical reaction. Just like in the case of CK, creatine kinase, this LDH has subunits composed of H and M. In the case of CK, you have M and B. In the case of LDH, you have H and M. Let's start with the first two isoenzymes, LDH1 and 2. LDH1 has four H subunits, while LDH2 has three H subunits and one M subunit. And this is this will somehow make it easy for you to memorize that LDH1 and 2 are both present in the heart, cardiac muscles. So, expect that if a patient has acute myocardial infarction, aside from AST, aside from CK, LDH will also be elevated. Aside from the heart, LDH1 and 2 can also be seen in red blood cells. So, people with hemolytic anemia, there is destruction of red blood cells brought about by antibodies or um, a good example will be G6PD, wherein there is precipitation of hemoglobin in the cytoplasm of red cells, thereby making them lose their deformability characteristic. So as long as these red cells are destroyed, what will leak out from their cytoplasm is LDH1 and 2. So expect that this enzyme will also be elevated in hemolytic anemias. The next is LDH3. It has two H subunits and two M subunits. LDH3 is found in three tissue sources. We have the lungs, we have the lymphocytes, and we have the pancreas. So any disorder concerning the, the lungs, just like in the case of pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, any disease concerning the lymphocytes such as in leukemia, any disorder concerning the pancreas, especially in acute pancreatitis, will cause elevation in LDH, particularly what isoenzyme? LDH3. At this point, we have already discussed several tissue sources, no? So just expect that LDH is really the least tissue-specific. And if the person has high serum LDH, it's really hard for the physician to determine what's the possible source. Do you know? If the doctor is suspecting that the patient is having a cancer, one of the enzymes that the doctor can request is LDH. Because if LDH is elevated, it would only mean that there is something wrong inside the body. It's just that it would be hard for the doctor to know uh, what particular organ is having the disorder. But at least the doctor would know that there's something wrong. The next Isoenzyme is LDH4. This time, you have one H subunit and you have three M subunits. And this one is found in the liver. So, hepatitis and other liver disorders can also cause elevation in LDH, particularly LDH4. The last, which has the four M subunits, MMMM, muscle, skeletal muscle. So, this will also be Elevate LDH will also be elevated in muscle disorders. Before you'll proceed with this part of the lecture, please make sure that you have already understood all of the things that we have discussed about the individual enzymes. Because in this part of the lecture, I will be discussing to you the summary. And you won't be able to relate to my discussion if you have not yet understood the discussions on the individual enzymes. So if you're not yet confident, please go back to the part of the lecture that you still find confusing. But if you are confident, then we will proceed with discussing the summary. Let's start with biliary tract obstruction. So what are the enzymes that you can request as a doctor or process as a specimen as medical technologies in the laboratory if you want to diagnose a case of biliary tract obstruction? So you can what? Process... GGT, and 
ALP. But among these two, which do you think is more specific to the bile duct obstruction? Yes, it's gamma glutamyl transferase because remember, ALP can be found in Hopi, hepatic, osteoblast, placental, and intestinal. So there are a lot of possible sources of ALP. So a, pati a patient with uh, right upper quadrant abdominal pain plus high ALP, yes, may have punk, uh, bile duct obstruction, but to really make sure, you can have the GGT tested. Now, GGT can also be used to assess chronic alcoholic drinking states. Next, how about liver disorders? What are the enzymes that we can request to diagnose possible diseases involving the liver? We have ALT. I intentionally pronounce it that way to emphasize that L there is representing liver for you to easily re uh, remember this. We have ALP. But the problem with ALP is that, yes, it is found in hepatocytes, but the higher concentration is found in the bile duct. So high, AL, um, high ALP is more of suggestive of bile duct obstruction rather than liver disorder. Next, LDH, particularly LDH4, but everybody, LDH is the least organ specific. So do not request LDH if you really want to arrive with the diagnosis that the patient has liver disorder. Then AST. Recall that AST is found in the heart, the liver, and the skeletal muscles. How about in the case of acute myocardial infarction? What enzymes can we request? CK, particularly CK2 or CKMB. The problem with CK is it is also found in muscles. Next, AST. Yes, because AST is found in the heart, although it's also found in the liver, it's also found in the skeletal muscles. And we have the least organ specific, which is LDH. So don't worry if none of these enzymes are really specific to the heart because we have other tests that we can request to diagnose acute myocardial infarction and they will be discussed in clinical chemistry. Next, how about CNS disorders, particularly stroke? What? CK, particularly CK1. Remember, CK1 is found in the CSF and not in the serum. Once found in the serum, it would only mean damage to the blood-brain barrier. How about acute pancreatitis? What can we request? Yes, amylase, what else? Lipase and LDH3, right? If you can remember, LDH3 is found in the liver, lymphocytes, pancreas. So which among them do you think is the most specific to the pancreas? Lipase. Amylase is found in the pancreas, but it's also found in high amount in what organ again? Salivary gland because of the salivary amylase or thialine. How about muscle disorders? What can we request? CK, yes. What else? LDH, particularly LDH5, the, the one with the 4M subunits, and AST. Given that you already know what enzyme can be requested to diagnose a certain disorder, the thing is, if you will process now the serum in the laboratory, how will you know if the enzyme is present in the serum? You must be able to determine whether there is enzymatic activity or not. So how will you assess whether there is really enzymatic activity? Expect that the substrate concentration will decrease because the substrate will be converted to the product. So since there is production of product, expect that the product concentration will increase. And also expect that the coenzyme level will also decrease. A good example will be NAD because let's say, for example, in this particular reaction, lactate is made to react with NAD. The hydrogen of lactate will be transferred to NAD. NAD will become NADH. So if you will try to determine the concentration of NAD, you cannot anymore detect it because it was already converted to NADH. So what are the determinants of enzymatic activity? Decreasing substrate concentration, decreasing coenzyme concentration, and increasing product concentration.
Thank you very much for spending time to study the lecture notes on Enzymes Part 2.